All right, everyone, welcome. Uh, in this video, we're gonna take a look at um, essentially kind of a, a roundabout way of getting to this unpacked red line sample. And you'll see what I mean as we go through the video, uh, but essentially I'm going to use memory dumps from triage in order to uh, identify the unpacked sample, kind of skip over all of the, you know, the, the obfuscation and sort of unpacking phases in this first stage of this .NET um, dropper downloader. Uh, and, um, and and then talk a little bit about some of the limitations with that. The, this is meant to be a part two of a, of a two-part series. Uh, the first is where there was a, a OneNote document that led to this sample. So I've added the link here to that video if you'd like to take a look, but certainly you don't really need that background unless you're curious as to how we got to Redline via the OneNote doc. Um, you know, this video is, is enough and, and sort of you know, self-contained. Uh, so you might be thinking with, with the Redline sample, we have everything we need here. You know, we have uh, clear identification, we have malware config extraction, so therefore you know, we know kind of the important pieces of information as well as what it's capable of doing. But um, you know, this just prevented, presented an opportunity where I ran into some trouble with my initial analysis looking at this in .NET, and I thought um, you know, using these memory dumps, I haven't created a video around that and some of the, the challenges with those. So, I thought this would be a good opportunity to, to just kind of put some notes here, the, this process that I use on occasion into video form. Um, to start with, we'll take a look at the sample. Um, you can see in Detected Easy that uh, mainly all it's really telling us here is that this is a .NET executable. Uh, it is a PE file or, or an executable. It's not, a, it's not a DLL or a library. And really, that's about it. Um, we're not getting any information about the protectors or the packers or any obfuscation. And that's not terribly uncommon with .NET binaries. .NET has been very popular now for, for a time to be used as you know, downloaders, droppers, as, as well as the malware itself. This means then that we can use a tool like dnspy.ex in order to decompile the code. And that's what I'm doing here. Um, I mentioned that this was an executable versus a library which means we can go to the project, right click and go to the entry point. And this will be where I head to if I have no other, you know, no other starting point or, or area of, of interest. Now, um, this is where things get pretty wild. You never know what you're gonna find here. Sometimes it'll be really straightforward. This is actually a fairly straightforward initial layer. Sometimes it will be just the beginning of a wild chain of very convoluted code. And, and, and .NET, even though you can decompile it, it can get fairly complex. Now, what's happening here is we have uh, essentially three web clients, so three downloads, right? So this is really a downloader. Um, three, well, two, well, there would be three URLs at play, right? And you can see that the first URL is to the host rentry.co slash you know, random character slash raw. Um, and maybe this is a thing, rentry.co, if that's even, a, if I'm even pronouncing it right, I, I guess I didn't look it up. Uh, and then the third one, kind of a similar, right? It's a different path, but it's the same host. Uh, for the second string though, it's using as the URL, the text from the first. So I decided to take a look at this in, in more or less a sequential fashion and to see if the values were, or these hosts were still live. Well, it turns out at least this host right here is, and that, that response returns a URL to the Discord app or the you know, Discord CDN which has unfortunately been used to host a variety, apparently, of different malicious artifacts. Now, the challenge with this is that, um, right, as of the time that I decided to make this recording, this is no longer valid. I can't, you can't curl the, re the request here, you can't curl this URL, or, or otherwise make an HTTP request for it. I, at least I couldn't, and get a response back. I just got an, an unauthorized access attempt or, or message along those lines. So I don't know 100% what this is. Does that matter? Well, if we look at this, what text two will be what stores the content from that request, it is used later down here. It's converted from base64 string and it's passed as an argument. You'll see this new object array. It's essentially passed as an object to a method that's being invoked off of this assembly. Uh, so what is this assembly? Well, this assembly is loaded from text three, which is our final request. Now this request here, even at the time of this recording, was still live. And that's just, a, it was just a base, as you can see here, it's a base64 string that turns immediately into a PE file. 
and then it's loaded into memory, right? So uh, we can see that text four is going to be this path to you know, you know, a legitimate executable. And then this method is getting uh, essentially this method off of the new.new .new class. So it's invoking that method and providing these four as arguments through this new object array. So what is text two? Uh, well, we don't really know. I don't know. Um, and we won't know until maybe we can build a little better context around it in this next DLL. Now, before we do that, you might think, um, why not just try to grab the content from a PCAP? And uh, that's, I think, a good thought. Maybe there's a way to do it. I, I, I don't know if there is one I've tried before, although not for this particular sample. And the reason being that this request was made over a TLS session, HTTPS. And so we can download this PCAP, but that content is encrypted, at least in the network traffic. And I didn't see it downloaded as an artifact directly because it's not written to the file system anywhere, right? So if you've got insight into how you could actually decrypt that, if the keys are available somewhere from triage or, or just, a, I guess, a, a technique that I'm overlooking, I'd love to hear it. But I'm under, you know, I'm moving forward here in my analysis with the understanding or the impression that I'm, I'm not recovering that data. Now, in terms of that file, we can take a look at that with Detect It Easy. I know there's not a way to zoom the text in here, so I won't spend a lot of time, but you'll see that this does identify a protector as Confuser EX, Confuser EX 1.x series, which means that, yeah, probably here the obfuscation is, is going to be up to a, a level quite a bit more than the last, than that previous stage that we were looking at. Um, I Now, I went ahead and the first, this first, like, if you were to download that base 64 payload and decode it, you'd see that it, part of that obfuscation is the Unicode characters in the, the functions and the variable names. Um, so I went ahead and used DE4 dot, yes, it still can come in handy, to remove that. And that's the sample that we're going to look at here, right? So that's the one thing that I'm not going to go through just because I've, I've gone through that in a number of videos. Uh, this is... If we go back to Detect It Easy, you'll see the type up here, this is a DLL. And we know that because of what happened when we were analyzing that .NET. So there isn't really an ability to right click and say go to entry point because we have to know that. Now, fortunately, the code that we, we, we left off with has identified that for us. We know the method that's going to be invoked. And it's this method right here, the one that appears to just be you know, a, a random sequence of alphanumeric characters. This matches up, there's four arguments, string, string, a byte array, and a bool. Um, but the problem that I ran into at this point with, and again, this is the latest version of DNSpyEX as the time of this recording, is that uh, it throws an exception, All right? So there are a couple things cross my mind. One is, well, what about you know, Visual Basic? Yeah, okay, if I kind of figured if C Sharp wouldn't de uh, decompile, neither would Visual Basic. But you, know, you might be able to, and it looks like you can, actually get some of the IL. Um, I'm not sure what's going on in here, if this is all of the IL for this mesh me uh, method. The IL or the intermediate language is, is, is just really what that bytecode is dis more or less disassembled into before it's then decompiled or converted into the higher level syntax that we've co come to know and love, which is the C Sharp or the VB. So yeah, okay, we could do that. I, you know, I don't spend a lot of time actually looking at IL, so I didn't really want to have to start looking up instructions and remembering what everything does. Um, so I decided to go a different route. Now you can look at some of the methods here after being cleaned up, and you can see create process, get thread context, reprocess memory, resume said thread, resume thread, set thread context, um, unmap view of section, all of the APIs that are telltale that uh, process hollowing is going to occur. And we also, if you recall, let's go back to the entry point here. Um, sorry about that, there it is. And this we know we can look at C-sharp. It, it passed in to the method, apparently, the target process that's going to be hollowed. So if you just keep in mind for a moment the CAS pol.exe, and we go back and take a look at the process behavior that was observed or recorded in triage, you can see, well, there's, there's the stage that we're looking at, 
and then you can see CAS, you know, CSPOL.exe, that's being executed. Right? So, you know, it looks very, it, it appears then that that, you know, process hollowing is definitely the technique. So instead of wrestling with these issues and, and having to go and, and refresh my memory on IL Spy, uh, I decided to try working with the memory dumps. And if you open or expand the downloads folder, you'll see that there are memory dumps just throughout the execution. And you'll have uh, the process ID. Uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head what the number represents there, but then I would imagine that this is the base of the allocation, the virtual address, as well as probably the size. Um, maybe it's the ending address. I'm not 100% sure on that either. Uh, but what I'm looking for then is, you know, well, likely that the PE file, that final payload, will be in memory because it's going to be, it has to be, you know, deobfuscated in the, the DLL that we're looking at in order to be then injected into the process that's being hollowed. So what I did was I downloaded all of those memory dumps, as you can see here, and just ran this command over it. Um, I'm not the most proficient when it comes to PowerShell um, and using some of the, the things that you would do normally in a, in a Bash or a Linux environment pretty quickly. Uh, for example, just you do you know doing file star. Uh, I couldn't. This is the both the best I could find is an equivalent for that. So um, I've installed the Sys Internal Suite tools on here and just found four files, giving it an argument of file.exe and then each file. So this actually seemed to work quite well, although it was kind of embarrassing how long it took uh, me to pull that command together. But there you go. At least now maybe hopefully you can benefit from that. And what I was looking for then is just from all those memory dumps, um, I wanted to find, you can see there's a lot of .NET assemblies, but what I was hoping to find is a non-DLL, right? So these, these are all, of course, DLLs, but there's only two of them that are not. Uh, so there's only really two candidates in my mind. Now, keep in mind, these are memory dumps. So likely these were already injected into memory, they were executing, and so the state of that PE file is going to be different. Namely, the, the sections are gonna be aligned differently because they're in memory. They're not um, at their raw offsets as they are when they're on disk. This means that while file will work fine, and file will tell us, like you can see here, that these are PE files, file is using typically the header data that doesn't change once it's in memory, once we start trying to analyze these files further, there's going to be issues. So before we get to that, let's first identify our sample. All right. And again, just to save some time here, what I did and the reason you saw the strings is um, I just dumped strings on both of these. And the second sample, we'll let this run a little bit here. The idea being that if this is in fact, if one of these is in fact our you know, more or less unpacked red line, then there should be some pretty clear strings. That doesn't always work, uh, and, but in this case it did. I'll just scroll back and I think what caught my eye, let's see, uh, certainly large base64 encoded strings, uh, IP lookup information, um, some, you know, WMI-ish looking queries, even though the, 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 the context here, the string looks a little bit broken up. Um, it certainly seemed like this was the right one. Strings on the other binary ended up being the, the stage that we're analyzing. So it ended up being basically itself. It was this library right here. Okay, so what happens? Let's close some of these up here as we're moving our analysis along. What happens if we just take that file and it was one... 37, and we try to disassemble or decompile it. Well, you'll see that dnspy will identify this more or less as a PE file, but we don't get any disassembly. And why that is, is because of that, so sections being aligned to their virtual addresses instead of their, their raw or, or on, you know, in the file on disk addresses. So, okay, so for this, I decided to use PE bear. When, what I really needed was just a hex editor that allowed me to, one, quickly identify information about the PE file format, and then two, to, to actually modify it. Uh, so a number of hex editors out there that can, that can do that. O1O is one that I typically use. That is a you know, limited trial commercial tool. 
Uh, PE Bear is made available for you know free and open source by um, Hasharazade. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. I've never known, um, but uh, someone who is, is of course very you know, contributes a lot of tools, and this is just one of the many tools that she has contributed. Um, so I definitely wanted to check it out, and it's it's worked really well for this occasion. So what it allows us to do is it parses the PE information. And what we're looking at in particular here is the section headers. So when it comes to a PE file, our sections have a, a raw. So the raw is, is just referring to where that data exists on disk. And the virtual is then where that gets mapped to in memory. So the raw address of the text section should be at an offset of 200 on disk. This is on disk, right? We're analyzing it on disk. However, it's a memory dump. So when it was dumped from memory and became a file, then it had the alignment of, of using the virtual addresses. So for example, okay, we should see the text section beginning at an offset of 200 hex. Here are the sections. If we click on dot text, you'll see 200 and it's a bunch of null bytes. And that's not correct because we, we would expect to see code in that section. So what we can do, uh, at least a quick way to fix this is just to take and make the raw the equal the virtual, right? And I'm just going to change both the um, the raw address and the raw size. Now, while this will allow us to decompile, it it's not going to execute. So there's more work to be done there if you want to execute the sample. But for now, all I really wanted to do was just look at uh, Redline Stealer Unpacked. That was what I was mainly curious about. Okay, so I, I think we can actually leave that one. Once we've made those modifications, then uh, I believe the easiest way to do that is to right click and save executable as. And I'll just save this to my desktop. Uh, I'm gonna call that redlinefix.bin. Yeah, sure, go ahead, replace it. Dump the file. And now what we'll do is we'll go to Redline fixed. All right, and you can see almost immediately, let me get rid of that, uh, we have a name, and if we expand that, we can now right click and go to the entry point. And we have code, right? Again, we can't, we can't run it because it's just the, the fix ups need to be a little bit more extensive, but again, we can at least see the code. And that's probably the most important thing. That's at least what I was out to accomplish to see um, if I could get in here and start looking at some of the Steelers functionality. Um, now, it's up to you, of course, if you follow along the video, you wanna grab the sample, you wanna take a look at it. Uh, I think probably the most interesting thing that I wanted to just take a quick peek at was where the config is. And that is that was found right there. So I was just looking for, you know, made sense that a, a uh, an IP address would be something that is protected in that config. Uh, it looks like here is a string decrypt. Um, I didn't really read through any of this, but anyways, here's our IP address. So we have an IP, we have an ID, we have a message, which is blank, and then an aptly named key. So this is base64 encoded, as is the ID, and then there's our key. So uh, let's just take that to CyberChef, which I've already done. I think this is just a little bit larger. Right, there's from base 64, then went ahead and uh, I'll just disable those. You can see that was what happened after the X, the base 64. So I just assumed that the key was used in an XOR for XOR encryption, uh, which it was because as you put the key in and you use the XOR operation, you get another base 64 string, which then you can decode and you can see here 172245. Let's compare that to the config extraction that was done earlier. And there it is, 172245, right? So no doubt the other piece of information for the bot family right here would be the one that we see in the extraction results. So let's do this, paste that in, and there it is. Okay, 
So that's it. There's our Redline config. Uh, of course, there's plenty of functionality in here if you wanted to uh, spend some time analyzing it. And then, of course, there's the challenge of trying to get your hands on um, a sample that'll run or just fixing this one up to do that. But uh, that's probably a topic for another video as this one's getting a little bit lengthy as it is. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any comments, feedback, things I could do better, uh, certainly leave those in the comments or, or send me a message direct. I'd love to hear from you. I, I you know, One of the things that I really enjoy uh, about posting content like this is that oftentimes, you know, the more I share, the more I learn at the same time from, from what everybody else is doing. So, so again, um, hope you enjoyed and I'll talk to you all in the next video.